Uh, welcome to SIRGI. Uh, my name is Stepan Greider. I serve as uh, director of uh, the Joint Workplace. And it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome you here. I have two tasks. Of course, you know, uh, you all know we're, we're honored and delighted to be able to host uh, Christopher Sims, the 2011 uh, Nobel Laureate in, in Economics. And uh, as many of you probably know, his visit to SIRGI is part of a, a fantastic conference that's been organized by, by two uh, SIRGI faculty members that joined us last year by, by Philip Matejka and, and Jakub Steiner. So thanks to them, uh, you know, we have turned into an economic theory powerhouse for this week. <laughs> and it's uh, certainly wonderful. We have uh, sponsors to thank for uh, uh, supporting both the conference and today's event. Uh, RSJ Algorithmic Trading, uh, uh, the American Society for Information, uh, the American Scientific Information Center. Um, uh, Google and uh, Tatra Bank, uh, uh, the foundation of Tatra Bank, and, and they're actually helping us to uh, support live streaming for the first time ever uh, in our history. We're uh, streaming this uh, event live on the web. Now, my, my next task, of course, is to uh, you know, uh, introduce Professor Sims, but I, you know, I, I cannot aspire to do justice to his scientific distinctions, and I won't even try, in part because I'm a labor economist, in part it would just take too long. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as you probably know, uh, Professor Sims is currently the president of the American Economic Association, has served as the president of the Econometric Society. Uh, you know, his work on, on uh, causality and monetary policy is a classic part of, of economics today. But he's worked in other fields, in part on, on the theory of rational attention. That's the topic of the of the conference that's taking place here in Prague at SIRGI. So, uh, you know, maybe you know, we probably know that Professor Sims is, is you know, one of the uh, great members of our profession who use data and, and, and statistics as the foundation for theory and for judging theory's relevance. So, so certainly very close to uh, you know research that's been conducted here. And uh, may I just uh, you know note that you know we were uh, we're fortunate this year to have, or this academic year, to have two uh, former Nobel, you know, uh, two Nobel laureates uh, talking on macro. We're also fortunate, come back to that in a sec, fortunate to have two advisors to presidents. Uh, a couple of days back, we had Alan Kruger, uh, as you know, is, you know is, is advising President Obama. And on June uh, 11th, uh, 5 p.m., we're going to have Philippe Aguillon. Uh, from Harvard, uh, also speaking on monetary policy, and you may not know that he's currently advising President Hollande, so you know, we're covering both sides of the Atlantic. And similarly, uh, you know, going back to October, we had, we had uh, Joe Stiglitz telling us uh, you know, uh, about uh, how he views the future of macroeconomics, and that's also, uh, I assume, the topic of today's lecture by Professor Sims. But, so between the two Nobel laureates, I'm sure you know, we, we will get it right. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. And uh, please. Yeah. I, I, I. Okay, this talk is, is not going to start straight out talking about macroeconomics in general. Um, I'm going to start by, and probably spend most of the talk, talking about the um, current policy situation in Europe and the U.S. and how we got there. Um, part of the idea of doing that is to illustrate that uh, my own analysis of why we got into trouble in the U.S. and Europe um, builds on modern macroeconomics. And in fact, things I wrote in uh, 1999 and early 2000s, uh, actually, if people had paid more attention to them, might have avoided some of, of what actually happened. And that's part of the theme here. Uh, we can't expect economics to, as a discipline, to uh, always give correct answers. But uh, as, a, as a lively academic discipline, it will probably include both correct and incorrect answers most of the time, uh, as it has uh, before, during, and since this crisis. So, and then at the end, I'll say a little bit about some of the criticisms that um, have been made of macroeconomics, some of which you may have heard from uh, Joe Stiglitz. Uh, 
but uh, I think I'll leave most of the specific answering of criticisms to questions and answers. So you, if you think there are things wrong with macroeconomics, I'm probably not going to answer your objections until Q&A. <laughs> so the plan of the talk is we'll first discuss the origins and policy options for the crises in Europe and the US. And then at the end, uh, I'll have a little bit of discussion of whether economics, economists, certain kinds of economics are part of the problem or part of the solution or maybe both. <clears throat> so let's first talk about um, EMU. Um, my view is that um, the founders of the EMU, at least some of them, had a view of monetary policy and macro that was based on monetarism, which is the idea that, uh, the, well, it's this set of ideas which, uh, which I list here. One is that a determined central bank can always control inflation by controlling money growth. Um, this idea was built up in part by Milton Friedman, who who did a lot of empirical study of the connection between money growth and inflation and argued that they were always tightly related and that a central bank by controlling money could therefore, um, controlling money growth could therefore control inflation. Uh, the in the monetarist view, it is possible for fiscal policy to uh, impact inflation, but the way it happens in this view of the world is that the fiscal authorities attempt to get the central bank to buy more government debt than is consistent with stable inflation. And so fiscal monetary interaction is inherently bad. It's a, they recognize that it's a source of, of uh, possible difficulty in controlling inflation, but the source is the fiscal authorities come and try to mess with the monetary policy of the, of the central bank. Um, <clears throat> Now, from this point of view, an institutional design like that of the EMU, which has a large single central bank facing a fractured fiscal authority of many smaller national treasuries uh, and legislatures, is um, therefore less likely to be subject to inflationary pressure from the fiscal side, because there isn't a big, powerful fiscal institution uh, that can pressure them. And, um, so there may, in this view, there might be less risk of inflation, uh, might be easier to control inflation in a, in a setup like the EMU, where the central bank is big and powerful and the fiscal authorities are fractured and small. <clears throat> but this view of the world misses some important uh, aspects of central banking and inflation control. Um, one is that uh, fiscal backing for the central bank is essential. Um, it's not essential day by day, but it's essential um, as a limiting, in some limiting cases. And the public and financial markets have to be confident in this backing if they're not going to be a possibility for serious problems. In other words, the fiscal monetary interaction is not one way. It's not just that the fiscal authorities may come to the central bank and try to force expansion of the money supply. It also may be that under some conditions, the central bank may need to go to the fiscal authorities and uh, get backing. And I'll talk in more detail about, about when that is likely to occur and why it may be necessary. Uh, and an institutional setup that simply cuts all connections between the central bank and the fiscal authorities actually uh, can create problems when the need for fiscal monetary interaction is, goes in this other direction. <clears throat> Another aspect um, that uh, is missed by this monetarist view is the fact that inflation is a fiscal cushion. <clears throat> um, now you can't in the long run inflate away uh, your debt. If, if you have a, a government debt uh, that's nominal, um, you can, if, once people realize that you are going to inflate, they will start demanding higher interest rates, and so the inflation does not reduce the value of the debt. You can, you can surprise people with unexpected inflation, and that will reduce the value of the debt. Um, but you can't 
of course, surprise, surprise people in the same direction over and over. You can surprise people with a rise in inflation, but then if that's going to happen, there have to be other times when there's a surprisingly low inflation or deflation. Um, and if you look, there is evidence. I have an old paper that actually calculates this for the U.S. Um, historically. Um, and you can see it in a broad pattern in, in uh, public finance in the face of major fiscal burdens like wars or natural disasters. Inflation, uh, surprise inflation, is a fiscal cushion. It can reduce the value of outstanding debt. And if it's done right, it can reduce the value of outstanding debt at times when there are uh, external disturbances that make the fiscal situation bad. And of course, that means that at other times when the fiscal is in situation is good, um, there has to be surprise in the other direction, lower inflation than is expected. Uh, that usually means in the US in the, in the latter half of the 20th century, this, these periods of, of unexpected gains for holders of debt tended to occur when in, interest rates were very high and yet inflation did not occur and the holders of the debt made very high temporary real returns. So this in, inflation, especially, Surprise inflation and deflation, especially in the face of big fiscal disturbances, is an important cushion. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but it's an, a cushion only if you're ins issuing nominal debt. It's a cushion that's available only if you, as a government, are issuing uh, nominal debt in your own currency. <clears throat> um, then, finally, um, a lender of last resort Historically, we know that lender, the lender of last resort for, function for a central bank uh, can be very important. We have, we're currently not all, not frequently, but but uh, at widely spaced intervals, we have episodes where uh, worries about counterparty risk spread through the financial system. Nobody is sure who is solvent, who isn't solvent. Nobody is sure who it's safe to lend to. And this it feeds on itself. Once, once people become unsure and are unwilling to lend, then that, that situation where it's impossible to get loans makes everybody uh, um, risk insolvency or risk being illiquid. <clears throat> and in such a situation where there's widespread counterparty risk and financial markets have seized up, uh, a large institution about which there is no doubt of, 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 fiscal, of, of financial soundness can become a mender, lender of last resort, can become an intermediary that uh, unfreezes the financial markets. In order to do that, the institution has to itself not be subject to doubts about solvency. Um, the most powerful possible such lender of last resort is a central bank backed by a treasury that issues fiat um, debt, fiat money debt. Because uh, a large bank can, be, can play this role sometimes, and historically in the US and other countries that has happened, bank, a private bank or a consortium of banks that was so big that there was little doubt about its ability, about its solvency, uh, has played this kind of role. Um, but any private institution, if the crisis gets big enough, the doubts about solvency can affect the ins that institution and then it's no longer effective. A, a country that, that can issue fiat debt um, has no counterparty risk, um, except for political craziness like the U.S. Um, House refusing to raise the debt limit. Um, but there's no reason the US should ever be unable to pay what it's actually promised to pay, which is more government paper. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there's no risk to investors in US government paper of if US fiscal policy isn't sound, because uh, there can be inflation, which will eat away the value of the US government debt. 
But in a crisis when counterparty risk, uh, when there's a perception of widespread counterparty risk, what people are worried about is that the obligations on paper when you make a loan will not be delivered on. Paper, uh, fiat money government debt never has that problem. You may be worried that you, you lose principal through inflation, but you are not worried that when you come back with the mature treasury bill that the government won't be able to print the money. <clears throat> so a central bank backed by a fiscal authority that can issue nominal government debt is the most powerful uh, fiat money, the most powerful uh, lender of last resort. <clears throat> now, um, and I think you can see that all these things are missing in Europe now. That um, the, um, um, it's not clear who would back the ECB if it got into balance sheet trouble or how that backing would be um, arranged. There is a, uh, a capital key that purports to show how much each country is supposed to, what purport, in what proportion each country is supposed to uh, provide backing if necessary, but this, the actual provision of the backing on a large scale would be a political issue uh, and it's not so clear that it would be automatic. Um, inflation as a cushion to fiscal problems is exactly what's missing in the southern tier countries now. They are all in, in unexpected severe fiscal difficulty. They cannot inflate debt away. Um, they, um, they cannot devalue because their debt has been issued in euros and the, these governments cannot print euros. Uh, <clears throat> and um, the ECB, as it was originally conceived, was specifically not supposed to be a lender of last resort. And there is no uh, euro debt issuing authority, euro wide debt issuing authority that can issue um, that can issue uh, debt at the euro level. All the debt, that's sovereign debt that's there is country by country. <clears throat> so now why does the central bank balance sheet um, matter? Um, the, um, it used to be received wisdom among macroeconomists that the central bank balance sheet was a fiction, uh, that importance of it was a myth. There was really no point in studying it. Uh, <clears throat> because the central bank should be thought of as part of the government and its balance sheet should be merged with that of the government as a whole. Um, and this was justified in the classic central bank setup of the US which influenced a lot of the macro theory that we see in textbooks and also of Japan. Before the crisis, these central banks had on the asset side of their balance sheet mainly fiat money debt is issued, fiat uh, nominal debt issued by their own country. Their liabilities um, are uh, also denominated in their own currency, of course. They're, they're um, currency and reserve deposits for the most part. <clears throat> the, um, these banks act as marketing agents for government debt. That is when you uh, when you come in with your mature bond, you go to a Fed office and it, it pays you off uh, the bond. Um, the, um, of course, they may, if this results in a bigger expansion of the money supply than the central bank wants, it can take offsetting uh, open market operations. But it's... Uh, essentially unthinkable in the U.S. that you would come to the central bank, to the Fed, with a mature U.S. government bond and it would say, sorry, we are not redeeming government bonds anymore. This is not so unthinkable at the ECB with uh, European government debt. Um, <clears throat> so this is what's essential to there being no default risk on uh, fiat money uh, bonds. <clears throat> So the central bank itself has negligible default balance sheet risk. 
because its assets and liabilities are currency, currency matched, and there's usually not very much maturity mismatch between their assets and liabilities. So it's very hard for their assets and liabilities to get out of line. And in normal times, interest rates are positive, currency pays no interest, so they're usually earning some seniorage on top of that. <clears throat> um, but now, what if the central bank net worth at market value is, were to go negative? <clears throat> Would this matter? Um, the, um, the central bank's liabilities are currency and deposits. They're denominated in, in domestic currency. Uh, they don't actually promise to give anybody anything in return except more paper money. Um, it's not as if you can take a, a $20 bill to the Fed and say, I demand gold or euros or something. You can get a new $20 bill if you want. Uh, and if you take enough $20 bills, you can get a treasury bill. Um, but you can't uh, demand anything from the central bank that it doesn't have. So there's, whether or not they have more liabilities than assets, uh, they can't, it, there's never a situation where when the guy who delivers the computers to the research department presents his bill, the central bank has to say, sorry, we don't have any money. Uh, central bank can always pay its bills. So that, that's one reason some people sometimes think the central bank's balance sheet doesn't matter. But if the central bank wants to control inflation, negative net worth can uh, limit its ability to do so. The easiest way to understand that is to think about what the central bank does to contract to try to reduce inflation. It generally does what are called open market operations. It tries to reduce the amount of money in the economy by selling its assets. It has bonds on its balance sheet. It tries to shrink the amount of money in the economy by selling bonds. People uh, give it money for those bonds. Or another way, what actually happens is people trade their reserve deposits for those bonds and the reserves shrink. And that shrinks the money supply, it contracts the economy. <clears throat> um, now, suppose it were true that you had a severe, severely undercapitalized bank, which had assets that were only 60 percent of its liabilities, um, if the public looked at this situation and thought they don't have any way to get any more assets, um, if I'm the last in line when I show up, uh, I won't be able to, uh, well, no, there can't be a run. The, 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 when the government is trying to uh, contract, it may want to start selling bonds, uh, but it may run out before it's contracted as much as it, as it wants to. Um, I have a, an old paper that uh, gives a more technical version of this argument that says if they follow a, what's known as a Taylor rule, where they make the uh, interest rate respond to the inflation rate, then a bank that's in negative net worth has limits on how strongly it can respond to inflation. In other words, there are it must tolerate more variability in inflation uh, if, uh, if it's in a negative net worth position. <clears throat> so, um, and, and once it's seen that the central bank is in this difficulty and may not be able to control inflation, of course that's going to affect inflationary expectations and make the problem even worse. <clears throat> so, um, the central bank doesn't need to be in positive net worth for the reason that a private firm does. A private firm may not be able to pay its bills if it's got negative net worth. Central bank can always pay its bills, but the central bank may not be able to control inflation if it gets negative net worth. So what does that mean? It means that there has to be, at least in a central bank, that runs a risk of going into negative net worth. There has to be some way for it to restore capital if it goes into negative net worth. In the US and Japan, under their old balance sheets, this was almost completely irrelevant consideration because there was, it was hard to imagine any way they could go into negative net worth. But most central banks, including the ECB, do not have 
a, ma a currency match between their assets and liabilities. The ECB was originally specifically forbidden to invest in euro area um, government bonds. They have a lot of foreign currency denominated assets. And this is true of most central banks around the world since they usually are trying to smooth out or otherwise control the exchange rate. They have uh, foreign exchange reserves, which are a major part of their balance sheet. And of course, that means that, that if the currency uh, rises in value, their, their liabilities rise relative to their, uh, to their uh, foreign currency denominated assets. So central banks around the world, especially smaller ones, uh, regularly go into negative net worth. Um, this doesn't mean they can't control inflation. It means that there has to be no question about ultimate fiscal backing. Um, it has to be understood that if it were necessary, the Treasury would print up securities and give them to central, the central bank for recapitalization. Uh, if that's true, they don't actually have to do it now. Everybody just has to know that if it were to happen, that, thing, that, that uh, assets ran short, that there wouldn't be any difficulty with recapitalization. Uh, some central bank charters actually make this very specific, that, that there will be automatic recapitalization on request of the central banks. bank. Um, actually, I was told, I actually verified this myself, that the last rewrite of the Swedish central bank's um, constitution or defining documents eliminated this clause on the notion that central bank independence was inconsistent with this clause. But actually, I think it's the opposite. Central bank independence in a sense of freedom to set monetary policy to control inflation uh, depends on not having to worry about policy leading to balance sheet difficulties. <clears throat> um, but if this is going to work, the bonds you give to the central bank to recapitalize them better not be bonds that the public thinks are going to default, uh, because then it just doesn't work. Um, it's got to be bonds that have real market value and could be sold in open market operations. Uh, there are examples around the world, in, mostly in less developed countries, of bank, quote, recapitalizations, where the Treasury gives the bank non-marketable, non-interest-bearing bonds and says, we've recapitalized you. But of course, that doesn't really help. <clears throat> um, so um, st ultimate st uh, stability of inflation control depends on there being fiscal backing from a fiscal authority that ideally can issue nominal debt, which is non-defaultable, so there wouldn't be any doubt that the assets it provides to its central bank are uh, freely marketable and not subject to doubts about, about default. <laughs> um, and the design of the ECB, one vision of it was that it was to be entirely independent of fiscal authorities, <clears throat> not carrying any euro debt on its balance sheet, that if they behaved this way, staying out of the market for European sovereign debt, that the markets would then provide market discipline to enforce fiscal policy soundness. Now, of course, that means that the, if you really follow through the implications of that idea, it mean, means that it had to be comp contemplated that interest rates would rise on debt issued by less responsible treasuries. This couldn't happen unless the people buying the debt thought there was some probability of default. So this vision of the ECB's operations with market discipline enforcing good fiscal policy depended on recognizing that default was possible. Because if it really was impossible, there's no way the markets were going to discipline anybody. Markets were going to treat all the sovereign debt the same. Um, um, But once you have the idea that every sovereign, every form of sovereign debt is defaultable, then you've eliminated the possibility that there's some surely non-defaultable form of risk-free government debt that you could be recapitalized with. 
Uh, in fact, just at the time when you're going to start to worry about recapitalization is probably exactly the time when everybody starts to be worried, worried about the possible default on sovereign debt, and then the recapitalization may not work out as well as you hoped. <clears throat> Before the crisis, the ECB conducted policy with an interest rate instrument like most central banks. They thought of themselves as setting the interest rate to control um, inflation. It didn't buy government debt the way the, the Fed does in the US, but it treated all Euro area government debt as riskless collateral and short-term lending. Um, there are no differences in haircuts on, on uh, collateral in that form from different uh, countries. And as a result, rates on debt of different sovereign countries got to um, be almost identical across countries. And of course, this meant that there wasn't any possibility of market discipline for uh, government fiscal policies. <clears throat> People sometimes point to this, to the narrow range of variation in the interest rates in, across countries in, in this period as showing that uh, markets really, uh, that financial markets really were no good at estimating probabilities of default, but I think essentially what happened was you were getting market segmentation. The people who recognized these probabilities of default were not buying this debt. It was banks who could, who could discount them uh, at the ECB that was holding most of the debt, and for them it was all the same because they could all be discounted at, at the same rate. <clears throat> so in the 90s, uh, Eric Leeper, Mike Woodford, John Cochran, and I um, started, uh, we really kind of noticed that the standard macro models in use at the time, if they took proper account of the government budget constraint and, uh, and uh, conditions for intertemporal optimization of private agents, that there were monetary fiscal interactions that were being ignored. Standard macro models started out, sometimes they didn't even mention this, they started out assuming that any time debt was issued, uh, there would be at least eventually taxation, uh, tax increases or, or surplus increases, the difference between taxes and, and expenditures would increase to provide the return on that debt so that the debt was not inflationary. Um, it was, um, it, so long as that eventual reaction was there in these models, it turned out you didn't need to know exactly when the, the, the uh, revenue response was coming. Uh, random disturbances in the revenue flow uh, didn't have any impact on the price level, so long as whenever debt went up, there would eventually be the appropriate fiscal reaction. And in this environment, the monetary authority could determine the price level without any reference to fiscal policy. <clears throat> but that depended on the idea that there would always be this fiscal response. It requires, uh, it requires that every monetary policy reaction uh, generate a fiscal response. Think about what happens. It's especially obvious, this point is especially obvious in uh, countries that have a history of very high inflation. Uh, in some Latin American countries, this is at the top of the minds of, uh, or was in the periods of high inflation, at the top of the minds of, mo of monetary policy authorities. When you raise the interest rate, the interest expense component of the budget expands. And in countries where the interest rate is already 20% and the budget and the debt level is a large fraction of GDP, um, if inflation goes from 20% to 25% and you think that as a good monetary policy, policy um, uh, implementer, you should raise the interest rate to 30% to cut off this rise in inflation, you have to ask yourself, what's the legislature going to do when I increase its, uh, the proportion of it, the, the interest component of, the, of expenditure in their budget 
by this large fraction? Well, in some countries, it's sort of obvious the political system is, in, is paralyzed. Taxes, uh, ta if you increase the tax rates, there's actually no increase in revenue because of the high elasticity of evasion with respect to, to uh, tax rates. So it may be obvious that actually nothing will happen on the fiscal side. So every rise in interest rate simply increases the rate of issue of government debt. Um, that's not impossible. There is an equal equilibrium in which that, that is true. And it's an equilibrium in which when the, when the Fed raises interest rates or the central bank raises interest rates, it doesn't have any contractionary effect. It only creates a higher rate of issue of debt and actually increases inflation. Um, and that was the, the recognition that there was this other category of equilibria um, and the delicacy of the dependence on, of the ability of the central bank to control the inflation rate uh, on these assumptions about fiscal policy that was emphasized in this, the in this fiscal theory of the price level literature. They, um, the theory was all about, was, it was really thinking about uh, the US um, and not uh, the European Union. Uh, it was all dealing with uh, an assumption that nominal government debt was non-defaultable. But from the perspective of this kind of theory, um, it was clear that central banks required fiscal backing um, and that the relation between monetary and fiscal policy was two-way and that therefore the institutional structure of the EMU had gaps. And I wrote a paper in 1999 saying all this. <clears throat> um, and that was modern macro theory. Uh, it wasn't that modern macro theory led us to these problems. It was that it was only some of macro, modern macro theory that had it right. And um, uh, it was actually this theory was regarded as, um, as very radical and strange uh, because monetarism really was uh, a kind of religion for a long time in U.S. Uh, academic macro. Uh, So I've already said um, most of this. Um, now what about if the ECB needs uh, fiscal backing? Um, in, uh, in a country which has a single central bank and a single uh, legislature and treasury, um, even though legislatures may be irresponsible, at least after a while, it becomes clear to people if, that if there is no f fiscal response to higher interest rates or increased debt issue, that it's inflationary. Uh, and it, in, the inflation happens. The public doesn't like it. The um, politicians see that this is a problem. <clears throat> in a currency union, so long as the debt is all non-defaultable, um, the fiscal response to monetary policy actions has to occur in all the member nations of the, of the union. And uh, that actually is much harder to arrange, both because there's a lot of different decision-making authorities and because the link between any one country's fiscal policy and the inflationary pressure is much weaker. So you don't have politicians who are you don't have the public recognizing that big deficits are causing inflationary pressure because they aren't causing much inflationary pressure in terms of euros. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in a, the, um, and also, as I've already mentioned, that uh, recapitalization and the EMU um, by bond issuance would require, requires agreement among all uh, members of the, of the currency union even though on paper it is supposed to be automatic. Okay, that's the central bank balance sheet, uh, fiscal backing. Inflation as a cushion, unexpected inflations and deflations tend to roughly offset surprise fiscal um, 
stresses in well-managed economies. In the study I mentioned before that I did of the U.S., you saw uh, unexpected deflation, in inflation occurring at the time of the oil crises in the U.S., and then a corresponding unanticipated higher above normal return to debt holders during the Volcker deflation when inflation, when interest rates on bonds went high and stayed high for a while while inflation um, came down. And that was in a period of relative prosperity compared to the oil shock periods. And it's certainly true that in most countries, wartime finance tends to be partly based on uh, inflating away some of the existing debt. Um, so, um, both U.S. states and European and EMU country members um, have given up the ability to cushion fiscal shocks this way. But in the U.S., there are automatic cushions in our fiscal system that are rather large, the, in part just through the income tax. We have a progressive income tax, and so a, country, uh, a section of the country that whose income drops has a corresponding drop in the amount of revenue that's being sent to the center. And most of the expenditures um, are much less sensitive to income or in fact, uh, the, the central government uh, contribution to unemployment insurance actually tends to move with um, fiscal stress. Uh, there is no car, there is hardly any corresponding uh, direct fiscal cushion within the EMU. <clears throat> um, and so that's another thing that uh, that's a gap in the current. Uh, it's, it's something that members of the EMU are giving up, inflation as a cushion. <clears throat> um, I've already made the point that, fiat, that nominal government bonds need never to, to default. Um, and the prospect of default uh, with a given configuration of future tax and spending uncertainty, default is much worse for a potential investor than inflation risk. Because inflation risk, when you buy a bond, you know if you can figure out what the distribution of inflation is, which is determined by the distribution of future fiscal actions, uh, you know what's going to happen to your bond given the inflation. With default, individual securities that you thought were identical start to become different. In the case of Greek debt, there's a different market price now for Greek debt according to whether it was issued under Greek law or European law. Um, you, default can occur in a chaotic way because all of a sudden people realize that the debt due on a particular date can't be paid. So that debt gets it postponed, whereas other debt is still standing out there and nobody knows exactly what's going to happen to it uh, and how much of the capital loss that debt holders are failing, play, facing is going to go to which kind of debt, which maturity, which issue of debt. Um, so um, that's another thing that's been given up by the EMU members, the ability to, uh, to um, handle uh, to have uh, debt that's uh, liquid because it doesn't have any outright default risk. <clears throat> now, with fiat debt, a lender of last resort, I guess I've already made this point um, when I talked about the beginning. The lender of last resort, if it's backed by a, by a uh, treasury that can issue fiat, uh, fiat debt, is in a much stronger position than than a lender of last resort that has no such backing. So with these things, points in mind, what should happen in the EMU? Uh, so I have a list of prescriptions here. Most people's reaction is this is impossible. Um, but I have a, a kind of uh, perverted optimism uh, statement at the end. Um, <clears throat> One possibility is make everybody realize that they've signed up to a regime in which they don't have an inflation cushion, they don't have an effective lender of last resort, they're going to occasionally need to go bankrupt, and then the EMU will come in and tell them how to spend their money. And 
that's, that's the total list of benefits to EMU. And I think that if that's, I guess there is an offsetting benefit. It is kind of nice not to have to change your money when you go across a border. But I think this list of problems with the EMU is big enough. So I don't really think it's stable if you try to implement this model. The other alternative is try to fix the in institutional gaps. <clears throat> that means um, uh, I think I mean financial coordination, not fiscal coordination. There should be, um, there should be an orderly bankruptcy measure uh, uh, mechanism, uh, something like sus suspension of convertibility between a country's debt and the euro for, some, for a span of time. That's what used to be done on the gold standard. Countries would, would suspend convertibility of their debt into gold and promise they would come back to parity at some point. Uh, the British used to do that. Uh, it gives fiscal uh, relief. It's very similar to inflation in that it, that it gives a kind of uniform devaluation of the debt. Uh, it doesn't give the, um, the change in country uh, real wages that you can get from an ex exchange rate change, but it um, would go a long way to, to to reducing the pathology of bankruptcy. I think that the reason the ECB treated all these sovereign debts the same is that they didn't want to be in the position of deciding that country A was reliable and country B wasn't reliable and having, having a lot of different interest rates that would be politically unpopular. Uh, they recognized that that was a political decision and it had fiscal implications, and that wasn't the business they should be in. They should be controlling the price level and not making decisions about whose fiscal policy was right. Um, and I think that in order for them to, to proceed, proceed the way they would like to proceed going forward, there needs to be some euro system level uh, asset that could be the main uh, medium for their open market operations. So a true euro bond, um, this would not, I think, require fiscal union in the sense of having bureaucrats from Brussels going to countries and telling them what to do. It would require that the institution that issued these bonds, which could be something like the EFSF or the ESM, um, would, um, would have the right to do what the ECB has been afraid to do, which is to say that some countries' debts are uh, better investments than others, and they will buy some kinds of debt, but some countries' debt, and either not buy or buy at only a discount some other countries' debts. Uh, but then they would issue bonds to finite their, their, finance their op operations, and those bonds, they would probably make a profit on average because it's likely that euro bonds that had real backing would be seen as safe and hence uh, command lower interest rates, higher prices than the country bonds uh, that would make most, uh, most of their assets. They would need the ability, they would need backing in case their balance sheet went bad. I think it seems to me the simplest thing to do would be to give them a power to add a surcharge on the, on the VAT. And this would, this is fiscal integration, but it, I think it would be less um, threatening, perhaps less unpopular than some system in which the Euro bureaucracy comes in and starts telling you how to spend your money. Um, it, of course, it is fiscal integration, so there would have to be political negotiations about it, some mechanism of, def of democratic control for such an institution, and that's a tall order in the current environment in Europe. <clears throat> and then um, another thing that needs to be changed, and, and that actually there's lots of talk about this now, and I think this may actually happen, is that financial stability regulation, at least for large institutions, it should go to the EMU level. It's clear that as we've gotten, as Europe has had more financial integration, you're getting institutions whose, whose operations run across borders, and it, does, it doesn't really make sense to have the home countries. Um, regulatory authority 
making decisions about an institution whose collapse would affect most of, of Europe. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of resistance to this, partly I think because uh, the country's central banks at the time of formation of the EMU were very worried about what they were, what role th there was for them now. Um, and uh, if they weren't just to be research departments, they wanted some real authority and so they thought, we'll still be the financial regulators. But I don't think that makes sense in the current environment. So is this politically impossible? Um, as I've said, the Eurobond institution would apply fiscal transfers and would need to get, uh, democratic uh, legitimacy. Uh, somebody told me that they just yesterday, uh, some German politician had said this will not happen for years, uh, Eurobonds. Uh, of course, there are different kinds of Eurobond proposals. Some people have proposed letting individual countries issue bonds that then would be backed by all the taxing power in the EMU, and that's very different what I'm, from what I'm proposing here. Um, so maybe we should call these um, European stability securities, uh, and they wouldn't be, and maybe that can happen in less than a few years. Um, the, um, we should recognize that, and I think politicians recognize this, that there already are losses. Greek bonds are not going to pay off their face value. Could well be that Spanish Italian, and Italian and Irish bonds won't. Um, to the extent that these things happen, there are going to be losses to banks or to other investors. In many cases, fiscal authorities are going to, or central banks. Uh, we now have country central banks in the EMU system actually lending on their own account with fiscal backing from the own country, uh, which is, I think, a dangerous development. But um, these institutions, somebody's going to be taking losses. Um, and the fact that there will be formal fiscal transfers under some new institutional arrangements amongst countries has to be balanced off against the, the fact that if these things aren't done, There'll be chaotic fiscal transfers. Nobody's quite sure who will lose. So my uh, perverted optimism is that the prospect of this reallocation be a chaotic, destructive process might be enough to generate the needed political initiative. So let me talk a little bit about the U.S. situation. Uh, it'll be much shorter because the U.S. situation is in a is so much less complicated. We have our institutions. We have an independent central bank with regulatory authority, the national level backed by a government capable of running primary surpluses and issuing nominal debt. Um, our, uh, our tax rate is not particularly high by world standards. Our government, is, our government expenditures are not particularly large by world standards. We do have, um, well, I guess I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm talking now how we got there. We have these institutions. Before the crisis, uh, I think the main problems in the U.S. were that regulatory institutions set up for financial markets in the wake of the Great Depression were weakened. We repealed Glass-Steagall, which was separated investment from retail banking. Um, the SEC, an institution that was a supposed to regulate financial markets was populated by appointees who were ideologically opposed to regulation and saw their main task as getting out of the way of innovation. Um, and um, so then at the same time, we had the great moderation. And this is where uh, the claim that the economics profession didn't pay enough attention to Hyman Minsky is probably right, um, though I was teaching Hyman Minsky in my course on bubbles and crashes before this, but uh, uh, Hyman Minsky uh, pointed out a pattern in which stability, periods of stability uh, and low risk tend to generate risk taking. 
People in financial markets earn above normal returns by creating investments that are risky and hence deliver on above normal returns. If all the investments available start to get to be very certain, you have to leverage. You have to borrow to, uh, to exploit small differences in rates of return and small amounts of uncertainty. You blow them up by leveraging or going long and short. Uh, so there is a tendency for stability to breed uh, financial innovation that can create systemic problems. And there's too, too little incentive for people in the financial markets to think about what, what uh, the systemic effects of the innovations they're doing uh, are. No one individual really has an incentive to take that into account. So these are where I think the USA situation uh, arose. Uh, it's also um, true that there, economists and regulators didn't see how dangerous the situation was in the US. There were attempts by researchers at the Fed, for example, to ask what would happen if the housing market crashed. You'll, you'll hear there were people who, in the US who were saying, well, the housing market has never gone down in all, all across the US at once, so it's impossible. So you could find people saying that. But there were other people, in particular regulators, the, the Fed, who, who thought it could happen. Prices might drop. What would be the consequences? The data they had was mostly about the banking system. And so they looked at the banking system. They looked at past episodes of crisis and how the Fed had responded. And they decided, well, this would be a problem, but it would be temporary, like the 1987 stock market crash, LTCM. Uh, they couldn't see uh, any pattern of linkages in the data they had. So they concluded that it would be, it would be bad, but not so bad as to justify uh, drastic intervention. It's partly because they didn't have data. They didn't recognize the extent to which there were non-banks there was the shadow banking system that had created linked bar, uh, leveraging that was going to create a big problem. It was just not visible. And part of that was because of the regulatory forbearance. Uh, if you had proposed to people in 2000 that it was really important to send government forms to all, all these non-banks and have them fill out, tell us what their balance sheets were, you would have been told that's unnecessary government regulation and inefficient. Um, so what's the problem way forward for the US? We don't need to build new institutions. Our debt is high, but we've had higher de debt before and rapid growth in the 50s. The US public sector is not really too big, in my view, and I don't think our taxes are too high. So we've got room to adjust in, fis in our fiscal situation. We do have an aging population, like many co co countries do, and combined with implicit com commitments about retirement and medical care that are going to force difficult fiscal uh, choices. And they'll be more difficult the longer they're postponed. These problems are actually bigger than the problem of the marketable debt that we have. Um, the, the US problem is that these issues involve some people taking losses, and allocating losses is something that democratic government seems to have problems with. And that's something that's common across the Euro situation and the US. The US has all these institutions, but we still have problems because when Politicians have to run on a platform that says, well, some people are going to lose and some people are going to win. Um, it's hard to win if you're running against somebody who says, no, nobody has to lose, uh, even if that's not true. <clears throat> um, so my view is that both in the US and in Europe, it would be a good idea to have temporary, temporarily above normal inflation. Uh, this would help with uh, debt overhang and the fiscal burden. Uh, both the ECB and the Federal Reserve have been unwilling to state that they think it would be a good idea to have uh, temporarily higher, higher inflation. Um, their excuse is 
that um, it took them years to build up credibility of their, con the, of their commitment to low inflation, and they're afraid it would dissolve if they were to say, we'd like uh, higher inflation for a while. I actually think that um, proposals like Charlie Evans at the Fed, uh, Chicago Fed, uh, could avoid this. He, he argues that you should po uh, formulate the policy in terms of trying to get the price level back to its original trend line. That is, we've had below target inflation for a while. You could just explain that we'd like to get back to the trend line, and that's essentially a prescription for temporary uh, high inflation. And I think monetary policy is on a sound enough footing now that there really isn't a danger that um, a temporary increase in inflation couldn't be ended. <clears throat> we had a, in the 1930s, as most people know, in, in the US around 1937, um, the central bank took contractionary actions long before we had gotten back to full employment because of a fear of inflation. There wasn't any inflation yet. There had been rapid growth in the money stock. They were afraid that there was some hidden inflationary pressure and took contractionary actions. And um, I think this is a little bit like what we're seeing today. Central bank that's overly fearful of inflation in the context of, um, of uh, depressed economy. So now, just a little bit about this last topic. So, The reason this comes last is, is I've tried to give you some sense of the way I think about these policy options and the extent to which my own research and thinking about ma macroeconomics has informed my thinking. Uh, I don't think there, was, there were fundamental problems with the way I was thinking about economics that, that uh, shared with other economists uh, created the problem. Um, I think an old economic theory, monetarism, is partly to blame for the euro area's difficulties. It's an oversimplified view of what the central bank is supposed to do and how the central bank operates. And I think it's what allowed people to think that maybe it was OK, even though most people recognize that some kind of fiscal coordination was probably eventually required, a monetarist viewpoint did seem to suggest that maybe the consequences of not working that out right away would not be so great. There is also an ideology that uh, is, are some, is sometimes people try to hang on economists, though I think actually very few economists uh, actually subscribe to this ideology, but market fundamentalism. The idea, market fundamentalism is the idea that uh, regulators are always trying to think up an excuse to regulate, and they're almost always wrong, so almost every reduction in regulation is a good idea. Markets will do better the more we can get government bureaucrats out of them. Uh, that, that's a very simplified view. I think it would have been very hard to get academic, find academic economists who seriously took that view. Um, most of them re would have recognized that some form of regulation is uh, financial markets is necessary. There'd be disagreement about exactly what form, but the notion that every elimination of regulation uh, was good uh, wouldn't, really shouldn't be attributed to the economics profession. <clears throat> but there certainly were people, um, some of whom at least called themselves economists, who supported this idea. Uh, but these complaints, market fundamentalism and monetarism as having contributed to the crisis are not really complaints about the economics profession. The usual complaints have been that, math, that economics has become too mathematical, insufficiently philosophical, over-reliant on assumptions of rationality, overly Keynesian, overly reliant on new Keynesian DSGEs, and this doesn't exhaust this kind of, of, uh, of uh, criticism. Um, when you see these claims, you should recognize that most of them come from groups that were unhappy with the pre-crisis intellectual hierarchies in economics and, uh, and academics generally. There, a lot of them come from people in other sciences, advocates of minority schools within economics, post-Keynesians, Austrian economists, so on. Um, 
and uh, some in less fashionable fun, subfields of economics, like uh, history of thought or economic history, who feel probably rightly that their fields have been shrinking too much. <clears throat> now, the fact that these people in these groups use the crisis in, as an excuse to push their view of what economics should be doing isn't surprising. It doesn't mean their ideas are uh, prima facie wrong. It's just that you should recognize when you see these claims that they may, um, they, they are not prima facie correct because there may be interests behind them. <clears throat> so the, I'll make a little bit of a defense of dynamic stochastic general equilibrium policy models. These models became popular between about 2003 and the time of the crisis. Um, they are um, the first models that could really be at the same time fit to data, had the scale to be useful for policy analysis, um, and brought in economic theory. Now, of course, they had to make compromises to do this. But there isn't some other way to do this that was standing in the wings where, that would, the people could say would have done a better job. There isn't some other approach to doing quantitative modeling in a way that's useful from economic policy making. Um, so uh, I criticized DSGE models both before and after the crisis, <clears throat> and other people did too. Um, the DSGEs that were in in widest use did not have financial frictions in them. There, were, there was one leading uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium by Mark Gertler and Simon Gilchrist that included financial frictions. And if you read the paper where they presented this model, they try imposing a financial sector shock and it has huge effects. They didn't emphasize this as a result in their paper because for the same reason that you didn't find this model widely adopted, people assumed that financial, the financial sector was, was functioning quite well so that a big financial shock, sector shock was not very likely. It really wasn't that important to have it in your day-to-day in your -day model and it made the model more complicated so why don't you stick with the old one? Um, the, um, uh, so, um, they also neglected fiscal monetary interactions. I've talked to you a lot about fiscal monetary interactions. John Cochran and I and, and Woodford um, and uh, Leeper um, had criticized these models. I had specifically gone to central banks and told them that, that it was really a big mistake not to have an explicit government budget and to be thinking about um, future fiscal policy as affecting current interest rates and, uh, and, uh, and inflation. Um, but uh, despite the fact that there were these gaps, that these models didn't have fiscal uh, monetary interactions and they didn't have financial sector uh, frictions, they are essentially the only locus at this point for research on policy relevant quantitative statistical models. And they are where the best current research on correcting these problems is taking place. Central banks around the world have groups working on getting, uh, it's the widest, I think there may be relatively too much emphasis on getting the financial sector imperfections in there so as to explain history and not enough on getting the monetary fiscal interactions in there, which may be the important, most important problem going forward, at least in the US. Um, but I don't see substitutes for the basic framework of the DSGEs. Um, and I don't see them as, or I guess one other point that's not really on the slide, the people who built and used the DSGEs were, were and are very aware of the limitations of their ap applicability. These models are linearized around a steady state. Everybody understands that, that if something big happens that pushes away, us far away from the normal, these models are gonna become unreliable. In fact, I would argue that that's a major reason why the US kept interest rates so low um, before the crisis, 
that uh, there was a fear of deflation and a Japanese style uh, depressed economy and, as, and particularly a fear that if we pushed much below the steady state, there was a possibility of, of accelerating deflation, a really bad outcome. And that's not in the models. It was just in the overall theory, theoretical framework of the guys who made the models. They knew that this kind of deviation from the steady state would be very dangerous. The problem was they didn't see this other kind of deviation from the steady state, a situation where financial markets would uh, freeze up and have big real effects. So there are other objections to DSGE. I won't try to deal with them um, here. Um, let's see if anybody has questions. for the question and answer session. Uh, I, I do have a quick question to follow up. Uh, the long-term capital management crisis, as you mentioned, kind of was quickly solved, but, but it was known that it could have been a huge sort of big thing, right? Uh, why was there not more lesson drawn from that? I mean, it was solved, but still it took overnight and big players getting together and being forced to play, right? Yeah. It, uh, you can argue that people should at that point have have run to, Gar uh, to Gertler and Gilchrist and said, come quick, let us get your, merge your model with ours. Uh, I saw uh, on the internet in uh, Info Week or some computer magazine, a column by a guy who said at the time of the crisis, um, I assumed that uh, there must be some big model with lots of staffers who were ready to tell us how this happened and how to get out of it. And I called around and I was told there were just two guys, Gilchrist and Gertler. And I called Gilchrist, he said, and Gilchrist had the whole model on his personal computer. And so he was very unimpressed with the degree to which the economics profession had devoted resources to um, this, this problem. I, I think you can, and it, in hindsight, sometimes I say one of the lessons of the crisis is the benefits of hindsight. Um, in hindsight, when we look, when you, if you look at the time series of data on interest rate spreads, uh, you can see that they opened up and w this was followed by contraction in the U.S. a couple of times before in the 70s and 80s. Um, it's just that this mechanism hadn't seemed big enough to get into these models. But if we, people had really looked for it, it was there. I think one of the reasons people didn't look for it is they thought, well, those big spreads, that had to do with us not being in the great moderation. And a lot of people had the idea that the great moderation was due to the excellent monetary policy of the U.S. And so that this kind of instability and, and sudden rise in spreads wasn't going to happen again. But if they just been more empirically oriented and asked, Given that it's happened a few times before, maybe we should build into our policy analysis the possibility that this would happen again. We might have been better off. Could you, could you say something about what do you think about the causes for the great moderation, but according to your view? I, that's a, um, still a mystery. There is a Nice paper by um, Jim Stock and Mark Watson. Um, I think it appeared in the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity um, that uh, tried to untangle this and by using a linear model. Uh, and they argued that there didn't seem to be any big shift in structure of the linear, in the linear structure. It was the shocks got smaller so that you had to look outside, this suggested you had to look outside the structure of the economic model, that either policy was getting less random or we were, or technological change was getting smoother or another ar argument people made was some shocks that seemed to be technology shocks in these models had actually been due to financial frictions which were now smaller because of financial innovation um, there, despite uh, Stock and Watson's results, uh, which didn't 
say that monetary policy was so much better. Uh, many people in the Fed, I think, kind of thought that, that if you really got it right, you would see that it was monet monetary policy was so much more systematic and better informed and so on. And I, don't, I actually don't think that's true. I think it, had, it may have had something to do with financial innovation, actually smoothing things out locally while it was creating global risks. Uh, but I, I think it's a mystery. It, both, it, it's, it's a mystery that's really the same mystery. Why do we get an episode of low volatility uh, following an episode like the 70s of high volatility and then a new high volatility episode? One of the things I've argued is that even just in not a theoretical time series models, economists are not, haven't been paying enough attention to this pattern of volatility shifting and the possibility that these episodes of higher and lower volatility ought to be incorporated in our models and in our projections. <laughs> Even though I'm loud enough, I wait for the since it's going out over the internet. I'm also like step on a labor economist, but this may so this may be a very naive question. But going back, that's never stopped me before. Going back to the beginning of the talk, you laid out a very convincing argument that the need for the fiscal backing is the fear of a negative balance sheet taking away. Uh, open market operations in a, when there's a need to contract. And I'm wondering in the U.S. environment, I know that it's different in the European environment because of the other factors you talked about, why I'm worried about that. If I lose the open market operations channel, I still have a reserve requirement channel, and since it's an asymmetric po policy need, I only lose open markets when I want to have a contractionary policy, I can raise interest, I can raise reserve requirements. It doesn't go against safety and stability. So it seems like I still have full control over the monetary policy. Um, the, um, the, the Fed thinks that the expansion of its balance sheet doesn't create an inflation risk precisely because they think they can raise interest on reserves and that would be very contractionary even if they didn't do any open market operations. Um, the, um, and um, they could do that. Uh, raising reserve requirements, whether that's going to work in a situation where people are thinking about end games is not so clear. Uh, if if there, people began to worry about the currency losing all value, um, reserve requirements in real terms shrink as the inflation explodes. So reserve requirements might not work. Interest rate rises require fiscal backing. Interest rates on reserves require fiscal backing because uh, as you, the way the central bank avoids needing to go to the treasury very often is by having seniorage. So if it's reserves, as the U.S. reserves used to be, were non-interest bearing and their assets were interest bearing, they were every year turning over much money to the treasury and the only question was whether the treasury would complain about it being a little smaller than usual. Actually, I was told once by a member of the board of the Japanese Central Bank, they actually did have complaints like that. We budgeted for so much seniorage, how come you're giving us less? This was in a, when the interest rates went down. But if you've got a, a bad balance sheet and you raise interest rates, uh, you're, you've shrunk your seniorage, uh, the gap between, and in fact, in the current situation in the US where a lot of the assets are not government debt, there are other assets whose valuation won't just necessarily move in the same direction, whose rate of return won't necessarily move in the same direction as the interest rate on reserves. So you run a risk that you have a huge balance sheet, lots of reserves, you raise the interest rate on them and you start generating rather large negative seniorage. So there is a concern there. In the US, the balance sheet is not a problem. Actually, in the Euro area right now, it's not a problem. Um, in both cases, they've expanded their balance sheet and bought assets that are not government debt, hence are a little riskier, hence pay a higher rate of return. They're actually making money at a higher than than normal rate. The risk is only if there were a sudden collapse of the value of sovereign debt, 
and that either directly affected the balance sheet of the ECB or affected the balance sheet of the banking system in Europe and hence created demand for, uh, for expansionary ac action by the ECB. Um, but you're right, there are other things besides um, interest rate policy available. And I, I think that in the US, worries about inflation getting under, out of control are misplaced. In the Euro area, the worry would be, the, I, I've advocated that the ECB should be aggressive about supporting the value of southern tier countries' debt. Um, and that uh, keep its fingers crossed that eventually the, re the European governments will realize that if, it's, if they're to avoid inflation, they have to clear up the fiscal backing. Uh, the ECB could, could intervene in a, large, in a massive way, buy a lot of southern tier government debt. That would bring the interest rates down, make the budget situation of those countries much better, uh, maybe even for all of them except Greece, make them sustainable. Um, but then markets would have to see that if they attacked and sold those kinds of debt and made the value of that debt go down, that it wouldn't affect the ECB. The ECB would have backing. If people thought the ECB will be in trouble if there's that kind of an attack, then it could happen. And so it really, if the ECB, the reason the ECB is so reluctant to intervene is they can see it's not at all clear where the fiscal backing would come from if they needed it. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, uh, perspective. I have two quick questions and I would like to have your reaction. On it. The, and and the, going back to the slide on the prescriptions, what we are supposed to do to fix the problem in the Eurozone uh, or in Europe. Uh, for that. Uh, the first point, the first scenario that you outline is basically, it's, that's what you said, it's not going to be stable in the long term, but in the short term it might work. And my question is, but are, you, are you really sure that we could survive a bankruptcy of Greece, or not even mentioning the bigger countries, I'm from Italy, so I just, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one of the, the suspects, are you sure that we can sustain that? Because some of... Uh, Economists, but not also economists, would say that Greece looks like a, a Lehman Brother case times a thousand. Like we don't know what that's going to lead us. And the second question is is on the euro bonds because uh, in, in one of the, the German politicians who said that for many years we're not going to see them is Angela Merkel, and 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 you uh, you propose what you're proposing. I think it goes much beyond what actually that they are afraid of, which is also giving power to tax, to something that is not uh, in Berlin. And my question is, how would you see then the other, one of the proposals, uh, the proposals that are circulating now, which is the federalization of some, or a, a fraction of the national uh, debt uh, into this creation of this sort of euro bonds, but not that wouldn't give a blank check to the governments to do whatever they want, but it would basically help to lower the interest rates and to give some, fresh, some relief to the, to the governments now, especially in the southern part of Europe. Thank you. Um, well, I think, I don't see why that would, uh, to take the second question first, I don't see that why that would be very much more attractive to the northern countries. They, it would be uh, mutualizing some of the government debt, essentially taking, uh, creating fiscal obligations for other countries. Um, it wouldn't be, as you said, it wouldn't be a blank check, but it would still be a fiscal transfer in effect. Um, if, the, if even a small value-added tax or even the right to impose a small value-added tax if necessary is too much, uh, what we, uh, I think probably more likely is what we've already seen, which is a big capital injection uh, where a fund is set up with capital for, uh, provided by all the European governments. Um, the reason I don't, didn't emphasize that as the first choice is that, of course, then you are in a position of worrying that markets will test uh, whether you have enough in that capital reserve. So um, if it looks like enough to handle um, Portugal and Spain, but not Italy, um, will the markets decide, well, let's see what happens if we, 
if we force them to bail out uh, Portugal and Spain and then they're confronted with Italy. Uh, so I'd, I'd rather see an ability to tax if necessary, but, but I think that, that it, once there was a clear commitment to provide the capital and uh, not too much negative commentary from the politicians about providing the capital, I think it might convince markets that this was going to work. And your first question was, might Greece not be just another layman? It might be. I don't think we're quite as uncertain about who's holding the Greek debt and what the, what the links are as we were with Lehman. Um, but it, it's a risk. Um, of course, Greek has already defaulted. I mean, not everybody who is holding Greek debt has what they thought they were going to have uh, in euros. Um, so the, to say a Greek default I mean, is, is impossible. It's, is already clearly untrue. They've already done it. Um, the only question is how much further default. Um, and I think that it, it would not be the end of, the, I, I think it likely that it would not be the end of the euro if the Greeks defaulted. And, and it shouldn't be, shouldn't necessitate their leaving the euro area because I think if you have a notion that any government that ever defaults has to leave the euro area, there may be a drop, lopping off one by one of a whole lot of governments. <clears throat> Alas, I think we're all out of time. So let me thank our supporters again. And mainly, let me thank Professor Sims for a most illuminating lecture. Thank you so much.